I think there's one huge reason why the growth in this industry, well, among individual producers, mixers, engineers, one of the biggest things holding people back is that we automatically go to the most negative take on something every time. Think about every, I think about every time there's a Super Bowl, immediately, if you head to any social media, you're gonna find so many people saying, it was the worst thing I've ever heard. Or any live event on SNL of any era, they're gonna say, it's the worst thing they've ever heard. Or that's the worst thing that that band's ever done. Or why does this person deserve to be there? Why does this music exist? Nickelback. I don't even have to explain it. Just say the band's name and you know what I'm talking about. That used to be me. I was the guy who didn't think something was real music because it didn't fall into my small idea of what music should be or it wasn't part of the music that I listened to. And when I was younger, that was heavy music. It was metal. I mean, I was into some pretty cringe stuff. <laughs> I think we all probably were at some point in our lives, but immediately negating something because it didn't fit into this box of what we thought music was or what good music was or it didn't speak to us so therefore it's invalid the problem is if that follows you into a creative job and you're used to just saying that this stuff isn't real it doesn't deserve its place in the industry so i'm not going to pay any attention to it you're quickly going to become antiquated I think there's one good example of this, and this seems really on the nose because she is all over the thing anybody's talking about right now. Taylor Swift did not care for her music, wasn't really into it, didn't understand it. In my mind, it wasn't real music. And then I sat down and I, I wanted to force myself to say, so what do people find appealing here? That sounds so elitist as it's coming out of my mouth. But this was part of what I needed to do to learn, to get out of this unhealthy relationship with music. And I'll never forget, I listened to the 1989 record five, six, seven times through, and I really started to like it. I'm not gonna say I'm running out there to buy tickets to her concerts, but I see the appeal. Take a step back, go listen to Spice Girls, even further back, I'm showing my age a little bit here. Music that really wasn't Music that wasn't on my radar back then. And you go back and listen to some of those arrangements. Holy cow, there's some good players on those records. I'm just gonna say that. Whether you like the Spice Girls or not, I challenge you to listen to some of those 90s pop. That was a that was an interesting time for music. And I have a whole different level of respect going back and like listening and analyzing it. So I'm a recording engineer. I own a studio. People come here and record. During that creative process, there's a lot of decisions made. There's decisions about tone. There's decisions about arrangement, which is huge. <laughs> There's decisions about song structure and all these things play together. And all the musical tastes in the room come together to create whatever we're creating in the moment. Having access to all those tools that all these bands that I thought I hated at my disposal in an instance like this is invaluable. Max Martin created some bangers with Taylor Swift. It's hard not to appreciate the arrangements of that record. Whether you dig Taylor Swift or not, listening to some of those things, they're meticulously created and crafted. And there's something to be learned there, whether you like those songs or not. Nickelback, those drum tones and guitar tones, holy cow. Or the background vocals, Mutt Lang is a genius. I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who does not think those tones are good, even if they really think the Nickelback sucks. By the way, go back and listen to their one of their first records, The State. It's pretty good. Or even going back through time periods and trying to find out what songs stand up in the face of time. And there's one song that has stuck with me forever. But filter, take a picture. That song is ingrained in here. I have listened to that song probably, I don't even want to give a number, it's a lot. It's a freaking lot. I had bought the CD and actually wore that CD out because of that song. I couldn't tell you anything else on the album. I don't remember it because that song hit me so hard. But going out on a limb and listening to that band tapped into like an emotion. Go listen to that song and come back. You'll kind of follow what I'm saying here. There is such a 
nostalgia. The song itself like evokes this emotion. And that was really one of the first times that I'd ever gotten, wow, okay, so it's not just about playing riffs really fast. It's not just about trying to make these tones incredible, which on that record, the tones, I, I really like the tones. The overall delivery of the entire thing just exudes emotion. It takes you to a place. It brings up memories. Find whatever that is for you because you can learn more in moments about how to communicate through a creative idea with tools like that than you will by just hating on something because that's not the style of music that you listen to. I mean, heck, Umbop, Hansen, that thing is torture, but it'll teach you how to write a hook. It's hard enough to do what we do and not to try to put ourselves into a vacuum. Creating, listening to, mixing, mastering music all the time, music becomes less and less a part of your enjoyment outside of the job probably less so than the average consumer that consumes music normally. And I mean that to say like when I leave the studio, I listen to podcasts a lot of the time. So when I'm listening to music, I really force myself to get out of a comfort zone and listen, listen to something else that I wouldn't listen to otherwise. Hearing what people listen to and what they value in music or what they're trying to get out of it. I go back to that song, take a picture, filter. What is that song for other people? Clearly, if this song is out on the radio, it's connecting with someone out there. And what is that? What's grabbing them? Is it what's being said? Maybe. Some songs really have like this much lyrical content to them. But even when it's this much, what is it? What's being said? What's connecting? Is it connecting on a surface level and they just want to enjoy it and have a good time? Is it connecting down to something deep, bringing up an emotion that they forgot that they had? There's an art to what we do that's easy to forget about because we like to get into the weeds of what gear are we using? What plugins are we using? What, what DAW is better? When all this stuff really boils down to is, are you creating something that evokes an emotion in the listener? And it's connecting on such a visceral level that they can't explain it. They don't really know what it is, but you are able to utilize all these tools from all these different artists that have worked at some point along the line to create something that had no hurdles. There was nothing to get over because you've listened to and appreciated genuinely songs that you thought you didn't like. And you've pulled this knowledge from all these different areas, put it into this song and you can deliver this emotional nuclear bomb right in the middle of this market that you didn't think that you had any relevance getting into. Maybe I'm ranting just because I see so many people hating on so many different artists, but let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. Is there validity to this? Am I thinking too hard about it? Am I way too nostalgic? I don't know. Either way, go listen to Filter. Take a picture. Tell me if you like it. I'm Resident Loser Jeremy. I'll see you in the next one.